branch prediction, no? Are your topics? Yes. Branch okay. prediction. And today he's uh oh, you have something here. Today he's presenting the the talk addressing challenges in core microarchitecture research. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, so uh my my talk is uh, addressing challenges in core microarchitecture research. I've given this talk in various forms uh, for a couple of years, I guess. And my intent today is to uh, sort of reintroduce myself to BSE. I, I did my sabbatical here six years ago, and I'm doing another one. I'll be here for a year. And um, for you to, maybe many of you weren't here with the last time I was here. And um, I've done some more things since the last time I was here. So I'll talk about some of those things. Um, I really like microarchitecture research. Uh, that's how we implement an instruction set architecture. Um, uh, what we call core microarchitecture research is designing and improving general purpose processors as opposed to things like GPUs or neural accelerators or FPG-based computing. So I really focus on CPU microarchitecture. Uh, it's heavily researched, but it continues to be of great importance. Um, uh, although specialized processing technologies are on the rise, uh, modern data centers and uh, mobile phones and all kinds of computing equipment continue to spend vast numbers of CPU cycles. Uh, many hyperscalers, uh, like Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google, Alibaba, IBM, Oracle, Facebook, et cetera, are designing their own processors. So you, you, you see ads for jobs on different places. And you know, this company or that company is looking for CPU microarchitects. And it's many of these companies, small companies, big companies, designing their own microprocessors. And they really need people to help them design it. And um, I educate those people, some of those people, and, and so do you. And, and some of you are those people. So, uh, this is a typical graph that every computer architecture talk has to have that says, Frequency scaling is over. We can't get the gains we have in the past by continuing to exploit uh, aspects of Moore's law. Moore's law continues to give us more transistors, but uh, no more power advantages. We, we have to be very intelligent about how we use uh, the extra real estate. And it's not clear Moore's law will actually continue. Uh, so uh, you know, single thread performance determines response time in cloud, mobile, desktop, other applications. So it's very important. And improvements in that kind of performance are up to core microarchitecture. We can't depend on technology giving us these improvements. We have to do it ourselves uh, by designing more clever algorithms uh, to manage the processor. Uh, this is a little cartoon I made that I show um, as often as I can because it took me a long time to make and I try to get as much as I can out of out of it. It just shows, shows the uh, standard model of out of order execution. Instructions are fetched in order, executed out of order um, using something like Thomas Little's algorithm, retired in order, uh, and instructions per cycle is the metric, higher is better. And uh, my research lately has tended to focus on the front end that fetches instructions. It's critical to performance. We have to get these instructions into the processor uh, the right instructions into the processor uh, so that they can be worked on with the uh, vast execution resources we have. But this front end is kind of a bottleneck. Um, modern workloads require innovative approaches. Uh, there are growing instruction footprints. The size of programs that we want to run are growing more and more. Uh, massive amounts of data are being brought into the processor. So the size of data footprints are growing. Modern programming languages have large overheads and programmers these days tend not to program for performance. Uh, they tend to program for their, their own performance, their, their, their own productivity uh, at the expense of worrying about uh, where performance is going to come from. So it is up to programming language designers as well as microarchitects to extract performance from these poorly written pieces of code. Um, the work is hard in microarchitecture. Uh, most of the low-hanging fruit has been picked long ago. Um, industry agrees that much more focus is needed on microarchitecture research. Uh, Intel, for example, has redoubled its efforts in uh, exploring microarchitecture um, as AMD and Apple uh, eat their lunch. You know, take take uh, big uh, piles of money away from Intel. 
Um, there are, have been a number of papers that have come out that show that the pressure is increasing on front end structures, things like branch predictor, instruction cache, uh, instruction prefetcher, BTB, and so forth. Um, the rate of instructions, the rate of growth of instructions has been 20 or 30% per year that the instructions, the instruction footprint has grown and grown and grown as software systems become larger, more complex, more software libraries, uh, more less efficient programming languages for the sake of productivity and so forth. Um, I, you can't really read this, but the point from these slides is that both AMD and ARM um, have focused a lot on their front ends. And, and these slides are from uh, presentations that those companies have given uh, talking about the innovations that they've done in uh, front end microarchitecture. And what, what they're really doing is uh, trying to optimize single time performance by making a much more, uh, more robust front end. Uh, and there's another slide from Intel. I, I, it seems like I'm belaboring it. Uh, front end microarchitecture is important. Uh, oh, this is another slide. Uh, I particularly love this slide. This slide was designed by Debbie Marr. She was a chief architect at Intel. Now she's uh, gone off to uh, lead a startup uh, and we're excited to see what comes out of that effort. Um, this was from her keynote at last year's micro conference. And, uh, and I was very pleased to see that the first thing she put on her slide was branch prediction. She, uh, she believes, and it, it, a lot of folks at Intel believe much more research needs to be done in core microarchitecture. She asks, what happened to you know, uh, general purpose computing research? Uh, where lots of ideas are needed on bringing on crazy ideas. A lot of folks in architecture have moved to more niche areas of, of, of research and sort of abandoned core microarchitecture research, I think, because it's hard and the other things are less hard. Uh, but we sometimes need to do hard things to make progress. Uh, so, as a motivating example, and also just because I like it, um, I'll talk about branch prediction and modern challenges for branch prediction. Uh, I'll explain what branch prediction is. I think many of you probably already know what branch prediction is. Um, I'll show the impact of mispredicted branches, and then we'll talk about some research related to branch prediction. Uh, branches are problem instructions. The next instruction to fetch is not known until the branch is executed. You're going along, and then you see a conditional branch. Jump if greater than or equal to. We don't know what's the next instruction to fetch after that. So if I have a pipeline processor it's trying to execute many instructions in parallel, uh, and I get to one of these uh, roadblocks, I'll just stop. Uh, well, in the naive model, we just stop and don't know what to do next, and that really kills the parallelism. Um, branch prediction enables speculative fetching and execution beyond branches. That's where we see the branch and then predict this branch will go here or go there or just continue going straight and um, believe that prediction, go down that path and speculatively fetch and execute instructions. Uh, and that's that's been a great thing, but unfortunately, branch predictors can be wrong. This little cartoon shows the impact of mispredicted branches. So the, the uh, pink branches are mispredicted, mis misspeculated instructions brought in after a mispredicted branch. And eventually, let's see, I can run that again. Um, the All the mispredicted branches have to be, all the misspeculated mis instructions have to be thrown away and uh, fetched, redirected to the right path. And that costs a lot of time and energy um, if, if you know, if you have a, say a branch misprediction and the misprediction isn't uncovered for many many cycles, maybe it's due to uh, a comparison to a value that was a miss in the last level cache, right? So it took a couple of hundred cycles to bring the value in, uh, but in the meantime we speculated on the value, and then once we had the value, it turns out nope, we got it wrong. The comparison was wrong. All of the instructions we brought in on that wrong path are thrown away, and we start over down the right path. We wasted hundreds and hundreds of instructions and scores of cycles. Um, modern workloads suffer from poor accuracy and branch prediction because of increasing code footprints, data dependent branches, and short running threads. So these are some of the things that, that cause branch mispredictions. As we have more and more branches, the branch printer has to devote you can't really increase the capacity of the branch printer too much. So it, it stays at more or less fixed capacity. 
and has to be responsible for more and more branches and dividing its resources among more and more branches makes it less accurate in general. And I have some uh, graphs that show evidences. Uh, but this is a more optimistic graph, potential for improvement. I went out and got some Intel machines, recent um, Intel machines, and did some experiments on them. I have this little micro benchmark that does interesting things. And I, there's a knob I can turn to make the branch printer more or less accurate uh, based on the predictability of data. But the, the, so the program runs the same number of instructions, uh, but with different branch prediction accuracies. So on the y-axis, I have missed predictions per kilo instruction. That's, um, that's a measure of accuracy. So obviously, uh, higher is worse, lower is better. We want fewer missed predictions. Uh, and on the y-axis, I have instructions per cycle. That's performance. So higher is better. Uh, with uh, an Intel Core i7, uh, an Intel machine from 2019, as I increase the missed prediction rate, IPC goes down according to this curve. With more recent 2020 machine, it goes down according to this curve. And with uh, the most recent machine that I could get my hands on, uh, it goes down according to this curve. So what does this all mean? Um, over the years, so obviously as, as we reduce MPKI, as we increase branch printer accuracy, obviously that helps performance. But the rate at which it helps performance also increases after, you know, over the years. Um, if we could, Reduce MPKI from five to zero, that would improve IPC by 0. 0.17 for the 2019 machine, 0. 0.26 for the 2020 machine, and 0. 0.34 for the 2020, 2023 machine. So as one goes into the future, these improvements in IPC that we get from improving branch prediction get more and more pronounced. Reason for this is because uh, the branch prediction becomes more important as we have more and more execution resources. If we, for example, we increase the instruction window, um, now we have more and more instructions. The stakes are higher for branch prediction. Removing a branch misprediction allows us to have much better performance than if we had a smaller instruction window. So um, the improvements that we can get from working on branch prediction increase uh, and, and becomes more relevant as we move uh, into the future with uh, bigger and bigger processors, which is how Intel and the others have gotten performance. It's not through uh, having the higher frequency processors, it's through having more clever processors that have larger instruction windows or more sophisticated prefetchers or other things that just enable uh, a longer reach, uh, a, a more, reaching more instructions uh, in, and more parallelism. And the branch printer, the branch printer is really uh, the gatekeeper for that. If we had a bad branch printer, none of this could be possible. The reason why Intel has, yeah, and, and the others have managed to go to large instruction windows is because of innovations in branch prediction, making that feasible rather than just a big waste of energy. Um, there's, but there's this growing challenge I mentioned, um, larger instruction footprints, and that translates into increasing branch working sets. So a, a branch working set is the number of branches that a processor may be needing to predict uh, at any given phase in the program. Uh, more specifically, uh, you can define it as the number of static branches accounting for 95% of the dynamic branches. Um, so the, the important branches in the program that, that tend to come up a lot. Working set sizes have increased greatly. So this graph shows benchmark suites that have been important to academia and industry over the years, starting in 2000 and up to uh, 2022, and the trend continues today. Um, the average working set size in each of these benchmark suites has been increasing every year. And note this is a log scale. Uh, so working set sizes today are maybe hundreds of times bigger than working set sizes uh, from uh, 20 years, no, 25 years ago, uh, meaning that the, the pressure on the branch printer has increased a lot. Um, now this, I need to redraw this, but this, um, shows the impact of increased working set size. Uh, as we increase the working set size and we look at the average misprediction rate for branch predictors, uh, it goes up. So the, 
don't don't this part over here is just at some outliers where we didn't really have that many workloads with such huge working sets but from here to here what we're looking at is increasing the working set size of a benchmark decreases the accuracy of the predictor increases the mispredictions of a branch predictor and it's not just that it makes the branch predictor worse uh, these red and blue lines uh, are the state-of-the-art branch predictors and this green line is a branch predictor that was state-of-the-art like 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. And as we increase the working set size, the accuracy of the modern branch predictors uh, starts getting much worse to the point where it's not that competitive with the much older branch predictor. So uh, we need innovation. We need something to figure out, to, to, to get back that accuracy. And the same thing is true with all front end structures like branch target buffer, instruction cache, instruction TLB, uh, mu out cache, if you know what that is. Uh, but branch pitching is kind of special because these other structures can be scaled with hierarchy. You can have a, a second level BTB, second level instruction cache, if you like, you know, cache instructions in the L2 cache. Branch pressures are really hard to make hierarchical. It's hard to know what to catch. People are working on this, but it's um, not at all clear what the solution is. Uh, there's another graph um, that it shows more or less the same thing that, that um, it shows the average percent reduction in misses for workloads with a working set size of whatever the x-axis value is. And um, it's the percent reduction in miss predictions that the new predictors get you over the old predictor. And at, we, as you can see, as working set size increases, the advantage of the new predictor over the old predictor goes down a lot. With small working sets, the new predictors can be 60% uh, better than the old predictor. With large working sets, it's maybe 20% better than the old predictor. We, you know, so um, challenges are, uh, so the, the large working set size is that, that's a big ch challenge. Other things like data dependent branches, Programs have data. There's always had data, but these days there are applications that are very, uh, the control flow is very dependent on the data, like graph processing applications. Uh, mm -hmm. The same code goes over multiple different parts of a graph and uh, with, with very distinct control flow patterns. And that's hard for branch pictures to figure out. Uh, short threads, right? That's also really hard. Uh, there are these so-called microservices uh, or serverless computing where you have these really short threads and it takes a long time for these, these uh, cool branch pictures to warm up. And by the time they're warmed up, the thread is over. And so, and so you spend a lot of time with uh, cold misses and compulsory misses. So how do we build a branch predictor that solves all this? And I have some ideas about that that we'll talk about. Um, a little bit more about me. Um, uh, my goal for 25 years now has been to make computing go faster um, my shtick, my, the thing that I, that I do is uh, apply techniques from other areas of computer science to core microarchitecture. Uh, for example, machine learning and also circ circuit complexity. Uh, I pioneered the use of machine learning in, in architecture. I wrote this uh, with colleagues. I wrote this book on it um, that uh, you could go read. And it's got a lot of stuff about applying AI to computer architecture. Um, I have had a, a big impact on academia as well as industry. I've gotten some awards. I'm an IEEE fellow. I got the Bob Rao Award uh, the, the, a couple of years ago for my contributions. Uh, things that these are things that happened since the, my last sabbatical at, at BSC. I got the IEEE fellow, uh, the Bob Rao Award, the HPCA Test of Time Award. Um, we got a so micro. I'll, I'll describe our work in micro. That got the best paper award on branch prediction, and I'm in the ISCA Micro HPC Halls of Fame. Um, I also um, have been doing a lot of service. I, I, I have a, a, a problem saying no to things, but I ended up getting elected the chair of the IEEE Computer, Science, Computer Society Technical Committee on Computer Architecture, or TCCA. Uh, we uh, manage uh, many computer architecture conferences, including ISCA and HPCA uh, and ISWIC and NISPAS and PACT and these other ones. We, we, we sponsor... 100% uh, HPCA, 50% ISCA, and 100% a couple of other conferences, well, FCCM, the, the, the FPGA conference. 
I'm the co-chair of the ISCA steering committee. Uh, so I uh, and my, my other co-chair uh, manage how ISCA is run and we, we choose the program chairs and we vet the program committees and stuff like that. I'm the vice chair of SIG Micro, uh, which is the ACM uh, uh, special interest group that manages the micro conference as well as many other conferences, a Computing Frontiers conference. Um, and this year I am the program chair, program co-chair of micro. So in a couple of months, I'll be flying off to Austin to go see the micro conference. And many, maybe uh, many of you will be there too, or you'll get, get some kind of exposure to the micro conference. And um, uh, we have a great program in, in, in Austin, and I hope to see people there and um, that'll be fun. And I collaborate broadly across many universities. I, I There's people in, in in this room who have collaborated with me and, and there's a lot of other people who collaborate with me. Um, and uh, a lot of this work that I'll talk about is is made possible by my, my colleagues, uh, my student collaborators. There's some pictures of, but Leif didn't provide me a picture. So I, I you don't, I know what he looks like, but but you don't know what he looks like. But the other ones um, have contributed to some of the research that I'll talk about in this talk, but I have a lot of other, other uh, folks I've worked with too, and, and, and faculty who I work with. Uh, Tanvir, uh, when I made this slide, he was a student and now he's a faculty at, at uh, Columbia. He's not my student, he's, he's, but he's, he's a student, but, but I worked with him. All right. Um, so some examples of things I study, and I'm, I'm, one of the reasons I'm giving this talk is because I want people to, to know what I like to study in case they would like to talk to me about what they're studying and, and see how it might align and how we might possibly collaborate. Uh, I'm really interested in instruction fresh and, and, and front end. Um, I do a lot of work on branch prediction, conditional branch prediction, indirect branch prediction, uh, BTB management. That's these days becoming very important. And I, I've done work on that. We're continuing to do work on that. Um, instruction cache management, replacement and prefetching. So I, I, I have a student right now working on instruction prefetching. Data cache replacement or data cache management. So I, I've done a lot of work in data cache replacement policy. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, prefetching, so prefetching for, for data caches. Uh, I did a little work on compression for, for data caches. Uh, and this stuff with Mark uh, in, in uh, um, off-chip location uh, the, where where we uh, try to predict. Where it, it's, it's, it's kind of like prefetching. Uh, it, it, it's another um, aspect of memory management that can bring us performance and and and, and good energy savings. Um, accelerating address translation. Another thing I've worked on is accelerating address translation and with, with folks at BSC and some folks at Texas A&M. Um, it's improving these bottlenecks improves performance. And so on. That's, that's what I really wanna do is improve performance. I'll go deeper in the time that I have on two lines of read. I'll talk about some branch prediction and cache replacement work. And I may go kind of fast. Um, and I'll also uh, answer your questions. Uh, so, so talk about branch how branch pictures used to work and then how we changed how they worked. Um, they, you, this, uh, this slide, uh, you probably, if you take a computer architecture class, you've probably seen something like this before. The main idea is in the old days, branch pictures used to work by collecting a history of recent branches. So if a branch is, a conditional branch is taken, that's recorded as a one. If it's not taken, it's recorded as a zero. And then we shift these bits into a register, like a sort of wide-ish register, and then use this register, combine it with bits from the branch program counter, use that to index into a table of saturating counters, pull out a counter, use the high bit as the prediction. And then when we know the outcome of the branch, uh, the branch is executed, we know the, the, the branch is taken or not taken, we go back to that same counter and increment it if the, if the branch is taken, decrement it if the cache isn't taken. So, and, and we use saturating arithmetic. So uh, if it's two bits counters, uh, the, the values are zero, one, two, and three, and three plus one is three, and zero minus one is zero in saturating arithmetic. Um, in this way, we, we find correlations between uh, patterns of, of previous branches and the outcome of the current branch. This uh, so this is two-level adaptive branch prediction. Uh, it was uh, popularized by uh, Yale Pat 
uh, who, who many of you you know as a frequent visitor to BSC. Um, and it was okay for a while and, and it, it was kind of accurate and helped us build pipeline processors, but it doesn't really scale well to deeper histories. It turns out there's a lot of correlation in, in longer and longer histories. And every time you add another history bit, you have to double the size of the table that you're indexing. So this this stops working uh, pretty quickly, maybe you know, 12, 14, 16 bits. Um, and we really want histories in the hundreds. Um, so I came along and I said, let's apply machine learning to branch prediction. Um, and when you think about branch prediction, it, it's, it's it's very easy to cast it as machine learning. You have a set of bits as an input and a bit that you're trying to predict, you know, you know, the decision you're trying to make. And that seems like a natural thing for a neural network to do or some kind of machine learning predictor to do. Um, the best one, so we tried some ideas, the, the best one that worked out was perceptron learning, where you just have, uh, well, you have a, a vector of weights. Uh, you take the dot product of this vector of weights and the inputs, which are just these uh, binary uh, ones and zeros, taken or not taken. And that gives you an output and you threshold this output. If the output is above the threshold, predict taken. If it's below the threshold, predict not taken. And then we use perceptron learning to update the weights uh, whenever either we have a misprediction or we have a prediction that doesn't have high enough confidence. Um, so that's that's really how, that, that was the first predictor that we proposed that used uh, machine learning to do branch prediction. Um, it develops a linear decision surface in the, the space of uh, branch histories uh, that separates taken, not taken branches, which turns out to, to be pretty, it, it, if, since we can use longer histories, now that can be more accurate than the previous techniques that couldn't use longer histories, but there was still, um, uh, that was much longer histories. Uh, there was still a problem of, uh, if you know anything about perceptrons, they can't predict functions that are not linearly separable. Um, uh, so we improved that using path-based prediction that would develop piecewise linear decision surfaces. This is a little cartoon of the perceptron predictor trying to learn the XOR function and then a uh, path-based perceptron predictor uh, learning a piecewise linear decision surface that actually does separate the XOR that learns the XOR function. Uh, so you know, we had some innovations like this where we, we worked on the perceptron idea to make it in this case more accurate uh, and also uh, the idea happens to make it um, less latency sensitive. So, so it, it, it improves latency. Um, over the years, so we introduced this perceptron predictor. Uh, we improved it by overcoming the linear separability problem that I just described. Uh, then I and others came up with ideas for reducing the number of tables that you needed uh, by using, by hashing the history. So instead of having uh, one table for each of a hundred uh, bits of history, uh, we could hash the histories and just have a few tables. Um, then I came out a few years ago with this multi-perspective perceptron uh, predictor that used many different kinds of branch histories to, to do a uh, more accurate prediction. Um, and I used stochastic search like genetic algorithms to optimize the features because there are so many features now. Uh, the perceptron branch predictor is in a, in processors that you can buy today. All recent, AM, and by recent, I mean, more than 10 years, AMD processors have a perceptron predictor in them. Uh, these days, what they do is uh, they do a perceptron prediction followed by a TAGE prediction and use some kind of confidence to decide which one to use a perceptron predictor, I think, is a little, it comes in one cycle and then the TAGE prediction comes in the next cycle and can override the perceptron predictor. Um, IBM uh, Big Iron has had perceptron uh, predictors in it. Uh, Oracle processors have used perceptron predictors. Uh, in, for a while, you could buy a Samsung uh, Galaxy phone that had perceptron predictors in it. Now, I worked you know, with Samsung and, and designed that predictor myself. Um, the current state of the art in academia is a Tage SCL branch predictor. That's uh, from Andre Sesnek's group. Um, it combines pattern matching with perceptron learning. So he takes the perceptron predictor and the Tage predictor, puts them together, uh, and builds a very accurate branch predictor. Right. Um, 
So, and then this is accuracy over the, over the years. Accuracy has improved. You know, we had the very first uh, dynamic branch predictor had MPKI of over 16. And this is all on the same benchmarks uh, down to, to or uh, a few years ago, we got, we're down to about four MPKI. And the, the, the difference between my predictor and Cessna's nice predictor is very small. Um, and things have kind of stopped. I this it, this graph makes it look like there's like like there's a trend and there was, but then things kind of stopped in 2016, and there hasn't really been a breakthrough uh, in branch prediction accuracy, uh, except for our paper. Uh, but but in general, um, we need more ideas. Um, so uh, perceptron, the idea of of using the perceptron perceptron learning has made its way into other microarchitectural optimizations. Um, we continue exploring it. Other folks have been exploring it too. Um, we had a, a couple of papers on reuse prediction, dead block prediction, the last little cache using perceptron learning, uh, using this idea for indirect branch prediction. Um, so it, it, it actually, the state of the art indirect branch predictor in the literature today is a perceptron based uh, indirect branch predictor. Uh, data cache prefetch filtering. We, we, we have, uh, traditional uh, data cache prefetcher, we have a perceptron filter that's, that predicts whether a given uh, prefetch will be profitable or not, and then doesn't issue it if it doesn't think it'll be profitable. Uh, and then a, a lot of uh, other uh, folks have used that sort of idea uh, to improve various uh, memory management techniques. Uh, side channel attack detection. So security, my, 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 my student figured out how to use perceptron learning to, to know if the processor is currently uh, undergoing a side channel attack and it can generalize to, to side channel attacks that haven't been seen before, but that have similar signatures to previous side channel attacks. Uh, and then off this off chip prediction idea that, that, uh, uh, that I guess Alex you know, presented, where's that he's here in, in HPCA this year. Um, so recently we had, uh, well, we see two, two years ago, we had a paper in micro um, called Whisper Profile Guided Branch Prediction. Uh, the idea of this uh, was, it's a new branch predictor that, uh, the, the problem with branch prediction is you can't really make the branch predictor much bigger. Uh, people try to scale it, but it, you can't really scale it at the same rate that software is growing. Uh, it can only get so big before you can't make timing anymore with the branch predictor. Uh, so our solution um, to this capacity constraint is to move the work out of the small on-chip predictor and into the instructions in the program. So for certain branches, we will encode for that branch a predictor using a little encoding that predicts that branch. So when you come to this branch, it'll say, don't use the, the dynamic branch predictor, use my little encoded predictor uh, to predict this branch. And then so we can design a branch predictor for each branch for which this technique is amenable uh, that offloads the work from the main branch predictor. And then for the other uh, branches that don't really work well with our static technique, they can use the baseline predictor, which now has all this pressure off of it because about half the instructions are being predicted uh, by the instruction rather than the big branch, the, 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 um, the SRAM branch predictor. Uh, the general idea isn't new, but our proposal uh, is very practical. Other people have proposed the, the little, the, the, the encoded branch picture should be a convolutional neural network. Well, that's not really gonna work because you, you, the, the latency would, would kill you and, and the energy would kill you. Ours is just a little tiny circuit that I can just draw for you. And it's very simple. Uh, we presented uh, this and, and, and ours outperforms the previous work that uses neural networks too. Um, we presented this at Micro a couple of years ago, got the best paper award um, and interest from industry. A uh, downside of it is that you have to do profile guided optimization. You have to profile the program and figure out what these uh, little encoded printers will be. Uh, and that you know, means you have to change the tools, that, uh, the, the tool chain, change the ISA and, and make the profile programmer do profiling. We're trying to figure out how to do the same sort of thing hidden from the programmer, and that is something I, I, I want to work on. Um, so that's that's branch prediction. 
Um, I, we've also recently done some work on cache management in my cartoon again that um, shows loads and stores or other problem instructions. They, uh, you know, here it's just waiting, you know, the, at the head of the order buffer for this load to come back from the cache. And, and, and the rear buffer is full of these instructions uh, that can't make progress. And some of them are completed. Some of them need their operands, but they can't make progress until the rear buffer um, has more space because of this uh, last little cache missing uh, load. Uh, out of order execution can mitigate small delays in, in you know, the, the L1 cache uh, miss uh, latency. But these days there are just a lot of last little cache misses. How do we mitigate them? Uh, so there's two key ideas that uh, folks have been working on for many years, improve cache replacement policy and improve prefetching. Uh, cache replacement, figure out which block to replace and and, and, and hopefully it, it is a block that you won't be needing again soon. Uh, and prefetching is uh, predict which blocks will be used again soon, bring them into the, the cache. And so by, by the time they're demanded, they're already there and then there's, there's no latency. And so these, are simple ideas, and people have spent a lot of time working. I spent a lot of time working on them, trying to make them better. Um, so here's this is a little cartoon I worked a long time on, but I think I, I will not belabor it because I want to get onto other things. But it shows the idea of least recently used cache replacement. You replace the thing that was least recently used on the theory that it will be used furthest in the future, if at all, which is uh, sort of that that's. What you want to do, you want to uh, do the least harm when replacing a cache block, and that means choosing the block that that has the least impact, the block furthest in the future that may not even be used at all. Um, <clears throat> so I've done a lot of this work on on cache management replacement, especially. Uh, I started with dead block prediction. Um, I introduced machine learning into into it. Um, Industry turns out to be reluctant to implement some of the work that I've done. Some of the work that others. Do. So my my advisor Calvin Lin, um, he he, um, he didn't do anything with cash replacement until uh, years after I graduated. But he started getting interested in it, and his group has also done a lot of work. Uh, their most recent work was an HPC a couple of years ago. It's called Mockingjay. It's this really sophisticated cash replacement policy that has really, really good accuracy, really, really low miss rates. Um, and there's been a lot of work like this. It's very complicated. Uh, the people propose things like neural networks and, and um, using features from the, from the front end and, and um, mimicking Bellity's algorithm, the optimal algorithm by having all kinds of complicated hardware structures. And when industry looks at these things, they say, this is too complex. We're not going to. We're not going to do that. Um, a, a great a, example that I give is a lot of our predict, all of our academic work on dead block prediction is based on using the program counter to characterize a block as dead or or not dead. Right? So will a block be used again? Well, which instruction recently accessed that block? It turns out that which instruction accessed that block is highly correlated to whether that block will be used again. And if we can predict that based on control flow, uh, then we can say this block, based on the behavior of the program, probably won't be used again in a while. It's safe to replace this block or prefetch into this block. And that's great, uh, but it turns out you can't really use it in real processors, which instruction access to block that isn't available to the last level cache. You have to make a channel from the front end to the last level cache to make that information available. And I have sat with many chief architects of processors and they don't want to do that. It's hard. First of all, it's, it's, it's a new thing they have to do they didn't have to do before. And, but it requires the front end team to communicate with the cash people and also some other coordination and more weekly meetings and more personalities. And you know, it, it, you know, well, I'm being recorded. I don't want to get into, into, into insulting anybody, but, but, you know, you know, sometimes people have egos and then that can prevent them from, uh, from making progress. And the more people you have working on something, the harder it is to make progress. So the social reason that, that, that never occurred to me, that's a big reason why a lot of the re research we do uh, won't happen in industry because they're looking for things that are, that have more, I guess you I would call it social locality, right? Where 
the work can be done within this team. In the front end team, at places where I've uh, worked or, or consulted, there is tons of innovation within the team. Crazy branch prediction ideas that you never see in the literature, but they're trying them out. Between teams, between the front end team and, and the last little cash team, there's much less communication going on. There's you know a, a narrow interface, right? But but um, and but within the, the last little cash team, you know that they're doing all kinds of innovation. That's the kind of work that industry is more accepting of. Not to say that we shouldn't encourage them to do more uh, cross uh, feature collaboration, but if we want to have an impact, we have to be practical. Um, so my current work on last level cash replacement, uh, one of the things we realized is that uh, replacement and prefetching go hand in hand. If I design a great replace a cash replacement algorithm and then change a prefetcher, well, now maybe it's all of a sudden a terrible cash replacement algorithm. We really need the prefetcher and uh, replacement algorithm to know about each other and to design the cash replacement algorithm uh, with the prefetcher in mind. You have to model, if you're doing any work in microarchitecture, you have to model a good modern prefetcher if you're going to do work uh, on cache management. Uh, we have a new, so I actually, I'm going to run out of time and, 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 and I want you to have time for questions. I have this whole other idea um, called insertion and promotion vectors that I have a paper that I wrote and we're working on it. And it's just basically a, a simple technique for improving last level cache replacement, really any, any cache, but we were focusing on middle level and last level cache uh, that doesn't require uh, special features like the program counter or other, uh, it doesn't require online machine learning. It's just a way of uh, managing placement and promotion in caches. You know, where, do you, where do you insert a block into the cache? And what do you do when you touch a block again in the cache? And uh, we can come up with a set of policies, very simple policies that outperform or at least match uh, state-of-the-art, weird, uh, neural network-based uh, cache replacement policies. And um, is the more animations, I can show this to you at any any time you want, but it kind of shows the idea that um, the uh, insertion and promotion decisions are now um, more uh, uh, they reduce the number of dead blocks in, in, in cache. So here, here we have LRU replacement, it's got a lot of dead blocks. Here we have IPV guided replacement and it doesn't want to play, but it, but it, it just has fewer dead blocks. So the, the gray blocks are dead blocks and they get shoved out of the cache quickly and we keep more live data in the cache. Uh, and so that, that's a, a whole thing I'm working on these days and I have my students working on. Um, yep. Okay. And it, we also you know, have this whole stuff about in using it to improve prefetching and some results that show so far it does better than um, state of the art, which we didn't include Mockingjay in this graph, but um, we're working on it. So um, for future work, uh, in general, I wanna be able to improve capacity of latency constrained structures like branch pictures and BTVs. Uh, I specifically am very interested in working on branch prediction. A lot of my effort is just devoted to improving conditional branch prediction and an indirect branch prediction. Uh, I want to get access to representative loads from industry workloads from industry to do a better job of characterizing our our uh, our benefit. Um, Chips Act is this thing in the United States where they're they're giving money to chip companies and it's not clear what benefit that will have to academics yet, but we're we're trying to get some of that money. Uh, I'm continuing my my service roles. Um, my goal has been to make processors go faster. And I, I still think that that's fascinating. I, I think uh, each computer program is this little world of, of meaning and understanding that meaning can help us make the program go faster. Um, I, I wanna build processors that understand what the programs are trying to do by observing them and facilitating the execution. Uh, and I wonder how we can do this uh, with limited information that we can get from programs and limited resources that we have in microprocessors, limited timing, area, energy, and, and, and uh, the ability of people to think about it, the complexity of the processors. Right. Uh, so that's, 
that's enough. Uh, if you have any questions. Any questions from the audience?